Welcome to California Now, a podcast produced by Visit California. I'm Satirius Johnson. September is California Wine Month, an absolutely ideal time to hit the vineyards and do a little tasting. There's so much happening in September. Crush is happening, harvest. Um, there's just a lot of activities. If you want to get hands-on and, and interactive and really learn how wine is actually made, this is the perfect season to come out here and do it. That was Anna McPeck of West Coast Wine Country. She'll share her best advice on planning a wine tasting adventure in California, including tips on etiquette and some great places to visit. We'll also head south to Paso Robles, a central coast wine destination that retains an authentic, rustic charm. Katie Hayward of Uncorked Wine Tours will give us the inside scoop on why this town is generating so much buzz. It's all coming up on California Now. Welcome to California Now, a podcast produced by Visit California. Our never-ending mission is to introduce you to some of the amazing people and places that make the Golden State such a fascinating destination. If you ask me, there's never a bad time to go wine tasting in California, but September is a particularly wonderful time to head to the vineyards. It's harvest season for starters, so there's plenty to see and do as winemakers pick, sort, stem, and crush their grapes. And also, September is California Wine Month, 30 fun-filled days packed with events and activities designed to inspire you to come on out to swirl, smell, sip, and savor. Well, to help you plan your next or perhaps even your first wine country adventure, we've invited Anna McPeck, co-founder and managing partner of West Coast Wine Country, to share some of her top tips. Welcome to the California Now podcast, Anna. Thanks, Satirius. Happy to be here. You know, you're a wine country native and uh, you've worked in the hospitality industry for decades. So tell us, why is September a good time to visit wine country? Ah, it's just one of the best. I mean, the weather is a really great great reason uh, all on its own. But as you said, there's so much happening in September. Crush is happening, harvest. Um, there's just a lot of activities. If you want to get hands-on and, and interactive and really learn how wine is actually made, this is the perfect season to come out here and do it. There's lots of harvest tours and lunches, winemaker dinners, grape stomps. There's a lot going on. You know, well, lo- locals like you call harvest season crush because, well, that's when the grapes are, are crushed. So do you see an uptick in visitors during crush? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, August, September, October, probably one of the busiest times in wine country uh, and with good reason. Um, there's there's a lot to see and do. And it's a beautiful, beautiful season. So tell me a little bit about what you can see during crush that you can't see during the rest of the year. The color on the vines is probably, you know, first and foremost, one of the most amazing things. Everything's turning yellow and orange and red, just these bright, vibrant colors that you're not going to see any other time of the year. Very Instagrammable uh, everywhere. You can get behind the scenes at some of the wineries that have production facilities and, and see the grapes coming in, see them, you know, on the sorting tables as they're they're choosing the clusters that work and the ones that aren't going to make the cut. Uh, there's lots of winemaker dinners that are happening. There's lots of um, grape stomp opportunities over in Napa. A really well-known one is um, Gurgich Hills. You can go and grape stomp there almost every day during the month of <laughs> September. They've got fruit coming in, and it's it's really fun. It's um, they actually you mean like, you can kind of you... channel your inner Lucy and go wine exactly. stomp and grape stomp. To... Really, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah. You can actually get your feet dirty. Um, they have you <laughs> step on a t-shirt afterwards so that you get your like grapey footprints on this t-shirt. You take. <laughs> That home is a little memento of your stay. So that can't happen any other time of year. Oh, that sounds like a lot of fun. What about like for newbies? Do you think like harvest season would be a good time for, you know, people to have their first uh, wine tasting experience? Definitely. Um, you know, I think, again, with that uh, educational component, it's it's a great time to come because there is so much going on and, and you get that foundation of understanding how the wine is actually made, um, which, again, you're not going to get if you come in January or May even. All the fruit is still on the vines. Um, so if you're really looking for understanding the process, this is a great time to be here. Okay, great. Well, let's talk about some basic wine tasting essentials, like kind of info that first timers absolutely need to know, but the rest of us could probably benefit from as well. What's the first thing you tell travelers looking for advice? There's a lot of different wine regions here in California. 
it's big. There's a lot of different types of wine, and there's a range of experience and a range of price points. Um, so it, it comes down to the experience that you're looking for, what matters to you. If you've been here before, you probably have an idea. If you haven't and you're kind of a blank slate, then, you know, figuring out some of the answers to those questions like, what kind of wine do you drink at home? What type of experiences are you looking for? Uh, that's a really good place to start. And the other thing that I always say is don't get overwhelmed. The planning part is really fun and exciting. So don't get scared or overwhelmed about it. Okay, I'm going to get down to some details now. So uh, do you mind if I pick your brain for a minute? No, please do. Okay, so I've always wondered about like the number of wineries one should visit <laughs> in a day. You know, when I'm on vacation, yes. I want to see everything, but I, you know, I don't want to get intoxicated. So what's your advice on that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I have worked with a lot of first-time visitors who think a, a very reasonable itinerary for a day of tasting is seven or eight wineries. And wow. uh, let me be the one to that tell sounds you. sounds like a lot. That's, that's a lot. Yes, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, my ideal, I, I think, is three maybe four, um, which doesn't sound like a lot. But when you think about it, most wineries don't open until 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. You have to factor in time for lunch somewhere. Um, mm -hmm. Most of your tastings are going to last probably a, a, at least an hour, um, if not more. If you're doing a tour or some other kind of elevated experience, that can last up to 90 minutes, two hours even. So three or four is is ideal. And trying to pack too much in and to over plan is, is probably one of the biggest pitfalls that I see people make when they're trying to plan their trips. Yeah, I, I feel when you're wine tasting, part of the, the the great part of it is that you are kind of pushing everyday life to the side for a while, and you're just kind of chilling out, enjoying wine. You're usually in a really beautiful setting. And it's just like, why kind of rush things? Just Let's just enjoy the moment right now. Exactly. Why stress yourself out trying to pack in way too much into, you know, probably a limited amount of time? Enjoy your vacation time. There's There's nothing that matters more than just chilling out and relaxing and drinking a nice glass of Pinot or bubbles in a beautiful setting. <laughs> right. Now, some mm -hmm. wineries welcome walk-ins and others require that you make a reservation ahead of time. Why is that? And, and do the two different approaches say anything about what to expect when you show up? Yeah, that's a great question, too. Um, in terms of, of the why of it, uh, a lot of wineries that are going to be at maybe uh, the higher end of the spectrum in terms of price point or a more in-depth experience are the ones that are going to require appointments. Um, it, it also might speak to the region that you're in. Sonoma and Napa are, are pretty well known now. Um, and there's a lot of visitors that are coming, and there's only so much volume of, of traffic that they can handle in a day. So a lot of wineries have gone appointment only just to ensure the quality of experience for everybody who does come to visit. Um, the ones who offer walk-ins, it's it's great. You know, uh, Anderson Valley, there's still a lot of that. Paso and and Lompoc and, and Los Olivos, there's there's a lot of spots where you can just pop in. And even in Sonoma and Napa, there's there's a lot of walk-ins. But um, I would say in, in September especially, it's important to do your homework and uh, to know who requires an appointment and who doesn't because it is such a busy time. Right. And what's the difference between like a standalone tasting room experience, maybe something that might be in a downtown area versus going to the actual vineyard? Yeah. I, I mean, in terms of the experience, it's, you know, it's walking into a tasting room versus being out in, in a state vineyard. So if you're out at one of those wineries that's set amongst the vineyards, you, you may have um, more variation to the experience. There may be a, a portion of it where they take you out for a vineyard walk and you get a little bit of viticultural knowledge. Um, they may have production facilities on site. So you might get to, you know, go in the back and take a peek at the cellar room or the barrel room. Uh, whereas if you're at a tasting room that's in town, most likely you're going to have um, a bar and a host and maybe some some pairing bite options. But it's going to be more about the wine, more about just tasting the wines and learning the story rather than the whole experience of, of how the wine is made. And, and what should I expect to pay for a wine tasting? I know back in the day, I think there was actually, you know, you could go to a wine tasting and not be expected to pay anything. What, what's the what's the price <laughs> range for having a wine tasting experience? Yeah, that's um, that's <laughs> variable. <laughs> Those I days would are say. gone, right? 
Yeah. yeah, for the most part, yes. There are still some places where the tasting fees are pretty minimal. Again, in maybe the, the lesser um, developed regions, Anderson Valley, there's lots of spots where you can go in and tastings are $5, $10, $15, which is not bad. Um, and that's how it used to be all across the state many years ago. Um, so there's a range, uh, I would say, in broad terms, between $20 per person up to, you know, $150 if it's a really, really sought after iconic brand or if it's a really in-depth tour with like a food component to it. Um, I One note to, to keep in mind is that a lot of wineries do have a policy that they will waive their tasting fee with a right. minimum purchase. So if you spend $150 buying wine, they'll waive a tasting fee. Or if you buy three bottles, they might waive a tasting fee. That's not a standard across the industry. They don't all do that. But um, that's something to keep in mind. Absolutely. And, and let's talk about etiquette now for a little bit, because, you know, sure. What if you're at a wine tasting and say you don't like that particular wine? Can you pour it out in that vessel that's usually there at the wine bar or or you know do people actually spit out wine? <laughs> Would doing that offend <laughs> people? I mean it doesn't sound it's not a normal thing to do when you're, you know, having a drink with somebody. Uh, it sounds so rude, doesn't it? Just spitting it <laughs> out. Um yeah, but guess what? No one in the tasting room will be offended. Those are dump buckets or spit buckets is what they're called and they are there for a reason. If you don't prefer that wine or say it's your last tasting of the day and you've just had a lot and you're feeling a little tipsy and you just don't want more, use that bucket. Go ahead. Dump out the wine. Spit out the wine. I promise you that your host will not be offended. And what about tipping? I mean, is it expected for you to tip your your host at a wine tasting? You know, I wouldn't say it's expected. It is certainly appreciated, though. Um, it is a service industry, and the the folks who are hosting you at the wineries are, are in the service industry. So if they go above and beyond, if they took really good care of you, they would absolutely appreciate a gratuity. Is it expected the way it's expected in a restaurant? No, but it is definitely always appreciated. Anna McPeck had so much great information to share, we decided to split her interview into two parts. She already told us a ton about wine tasting essentials, and we'll bring her back later in this episode to discuss some of the most popular wine regions in the state, including some very specific recommendations on places to visit in Napa, Sonoma, and elsewhere. But now, I'd like to turn our attention south to Paso Robles, a very buzzy wine region located in the central coast of California. Katie Hayward is the owner of Uncorked Wine Tours, and she's led countless guests on wine-themed excursions in and around this rustic little town. Welcome to the California Now podcast, Katie. Yay, I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, we're excited to have you here, and we can't wait to learn more about Paso Robles. So let's start with location. Where exactly is it? So Paso is on the central coast of California. So literally, it's like in the very middle. We're about 300 miles south of San Francisco and about 300 miles north of L.A. So um, literally right in the middle, um, just a little bit in, inland from the coast. But, you know, Paso is about 30 minutes from the coast. So if you're in town and want to check out the beach, um, that's also an option as well. And wine is one of the big draws in Paso Robles. What's, what's special about the wine scene there? You know, the, the, it's 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 definitely been blowing up. We're one of the, the largest growing wine re regions in the world at this point. Um, I started Uncorked Wine Tours nine years ago, and um, it was just kind of getting into its vibe. And now it's it's just kind of blowing up. We're getting a lot of um, accolades from wine enthusiasts and um, just, I mean, people coming from all over the world, China, UK. I mean, you name it, we've we've had them. And it's it's pretty, pretty um, amazing to be a part of. So how does it compare to, say, like Napa or Sonoma? Are we talking like, is it a different aesthetic? A different, are there different grapes? We're much, much younger wine region. So I would say that, um, you know, Napa has definitely been around a long time. I mean, that's if when you think of a wine region, you think of Napa in California. That's just where you think of. We have everything from Zinn, Bordeaux varietals, Rhone varietals. I mean, it's it's amazing. I mean, if you ask a sommelier, you know, probably 10, 15, 20 years ago, we would be known for our Zinfandels. But what we've found is that we can actually grow pretty much anything here, which is which makes us stand out as well. Um, I know that you know, Napa is known for their cabs, but we definitely have a, um, a lot of winemakers right now trying to 
put us on the map for cabs, which we're doing, which is which has been amazing. Um, and as far as different blending, it's just it's it's anything goes. I mean, there's just some crazy blends coming out. Um, uh, it's really anything. I mean, we have GSM was a big thing, you know, five, six years ago. And now they're doing like ZSNMs, which is like, you know, Zinfandel, Sarama, Vedra, where GSM was Grenache, Sarama, Vedra. So they're just constantly experimenting. And, and there's some just crazy blends that you're just like, this is awesome. So um, it, it's really whatever they want to do, they can kind of make happen, which is fun. Yeah, that sounds like it. And I know that you created customized itineraries for wine lovers. So let's do that right now. I want to go to, say, three iconic Paso Robles wineries. Where are you taking me, and, and what makes each of these spots special? That's a question I get all the time. What's your favorite winery? <laughs> and it's, it's really tough because it's, I mean, there's, it depends on my mood. I feel like drinking. Is it wintertime? Is it summertime? Is it hot? All of those things. So I did come up with three that I felt were um, kind of iconic for this area. Um, one is um, Eberly Winery. Um, Gary Eberly kind of known as the godfather of the wine region. He just had his 40-year anniversary. Um, he is actually kind of the co-founder of Pastor Robles Appalachian. Um, that started back in 1983. So he's been around for a long time. They have a huge, you know, wide range of varietals on their tasting menu um, and just a family-owned and operated. So literally you'll see Gary sitting outside in the afternoon drinking his favorite Cabernet and you you get his, you know, he'll sign the bottles. And it's just, I think a lot of people love that about our area is that they, you actually get a meet the winemaker, the owners, they're always present and they, you know, you can tell that they, they'll, they'll love it. Um, another one that I just, I send a lot of people to is Janelle Ducey, J. Ducey Wines. Um, Janelle's family started um, growing grapes in our region back in the 1920s. So they were always big grape growers. A lot of the um, wines that you do find in our area hmm. actually have Ducey grapes in in them. You go in there and my groups just love it. This is Paso. This is awesome. So um, that's definitely one of our favorites. And then also uh, Dow Vineyards. Um, they have one of the most beautiful views as far as a wine tasting room goes. Uh, the Dow Brothers started their winery about 10 years ago. Um, we've always been big advocates. Um, they, they've they helped the region a lot. They promote our area so much and um, they've kind of changed the way things are going as well um, and, and in a good way. Um, they definitely have a, a, a class and a style up there and if you just want to go and have lunch or buy a bottle and enjoy the view I mean again that that view is is, is phenomenal and we're really happy to have them here and and helping with our our brands for sure yeah it, so, it sounds really great it sounds like you know they're producing really great wines and they are like smaller scale wineries so it's a much more intimate experience where you actually can meet the owners and the winemakers themselves just like you know so it just sounds really amazing Yes, it's it's pretty awesome, and like I said, yeah, nine times out of ten, you'll have the winemaker behind the bar pouring, and and they're so enthusiastic huh. and and um, you know passionate, obviously about about what they do. Okay, well, you totally crushed the wine question, but I I know there's more <laughs> to Paso than just wine, right? So where else do you take visitors? Yeah, so um, the beer scene has definitely been booming. Um, Firestone Brew is is pretty well known, and they're um, expanding in the U.S. like crazy right now. So they've actually got a whole campus, almost like Google, um, that they they have. Um, Barrel House Brew, they always have bands playing, food trucks. That's a great way to end. So a lot of breweries. Um, I think we have probably 12 to 15 that are around here now. Um, we also have mm. several olive oil producers. Um, so that's really kind of a fun thing, especially for people that aren't wine drinkers. You can do an olive oil tasting, right? Yeah, olive oil tasting is really fun. It's a good way to break up your day as well. So, um, <laughs> so that's a fun thing to do. Um, and then there's also distilleries and uh, Alex Villacana he was kind of the first to jump on this bandwagon and, and start the whole distillery process. But the the free run juice that was just basically going down the drain, um, he started you know capturing that and bought a still and and started making spirits. And everyone's like, well, that's a good idea. So now there's a, <laughs> I think there's ten distilleries. Um, so that's really fun. So people that don't like wine, don't like beer, they can actually come and taste spirits. So they have cucumber, vodka, limoncello. I mean, several different things they're experimenting experimenting with some are putting them in barrels and and making a whiskey type situation it's 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 just fantastic that sounds great and and let's talk about the downtown of Paso Robles it's a very walkable downtown isn't it 
Yes, it's it's definitely very walkable. I, I typically recommend, you know, especially for first timers staying downtown because you can just, you know, after a wine tour or after you go out in the country, you come downtown. I mean, it's amazing just in our, um, just the downtown alone, how many amazing restaurants there are, farm to table, Italian. I mean, everything's very fresh and, and yummy. They've got tasting rooms downtown. So if you didn't want to hire a driver, you could literally just walk around downtown all day and taste downtown. Um, really cute boutique shops and, and pretty much any, you know, it could be a good day. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, you mentioned the food truck scene. Um, what about the, let's let's drill down a little bit on the restaurant scene. If you wanted to, to have a nice meal at a you know, a sit down restaurant. Tell us a, about a few of your favorites in town. Some of my favorites, um, Buena Tavola is fantastic. It's an Italian restaurant. Um, really fresh. I mean, they make the pasta there and the experience and, and a lot of the, the serving staff actually has Italian, um, you know, accents. So it's, it really feels like you're in Italy almost. It's pretty fantastic. Um, and then um, Fish Gaucho, that's kind of a fresh Mex type situation. Best margaritas in the area for sure. Um, really fun atmosphere. Um, great food. Um, and then Naked Fish is also one we frequent a lot. And that's a, a sushi restaurant. Um, but again, really fresh fish and you know it's being clo- this close to the ocean it's it's kind of a fun thing what about uh tri-tip tri-tip is such a california thing is there like a paso style of tri-tip yeah there's actually um jeffrey's barbecue which just opened i guess it was like a year or a couple months ago but um he, he's good friends of ours but he he has it's all smoked and that's if you're gonna if you want that just traditional barbecue smoked yumminess then for sure go there i was just there on friday it's it's fantastic Oh, my God. It all sounds really good. All right. So where should we stay? I mean, how about one place if we're looking to splurge and another if we're looking for a bargain? So I, again, I always recommend staying downtown. I just think, especially for like first timers, it's just you kind of get the full effect. Um, we have definitely have a lot of um, hotels outside the downtown area, but uh, two that I would recommend if you want to stay downtown and get that full Paso experience from the get go. Um, hotel Cheval, a little bit more higher end boutique hotel. Um, but again, right downtown, um, all the amenities, they have s'mores at night and a wine tasting bar and it's it's pretty spectacular. Um, and then Passerable's Inn, which is a historic place. Um, but again, right down on the square, um, lots of history there. A lot of the rooms actually have um, hot springs in them. Um, mm. And again, you're right downtown. So you can just walk around. Is there is there like a best time of year to visit? I think the fall is definitely the most beautiful time. The weather is not... I don't really mind the heat, but a lot of people do. So it's 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 just beautiful. The um the vines are actually changing colors. That's when harvest is as well. So a lot of the times if people come here in the fall time, September, October, November, the the wineries are actually crushing grapes, and you're actually seeing that you know picking grapes. Or you're seeing all that happening. So if that's something people are into, it's it's a great time of year. The weather's beautiful. Um, it's kind of right before the holidays, so that typically tends to be kind of a busier time. But it, it's a really fun time of year to be in Paso for sure. Mm. Now, now, if I'm planning, say, a long weekend and, you know, want to take a day trip to a nearby attraction, where would you send me? You know, I would recommend going over to the coast. It's um, it's about 40 minutes uh, from Paso Robles at San Simeon, and that's where Hearst Castle is located. Um, it's an iconic, historic, um, amazing story. They have several different tours happening throughout the day. I actually have a lot of people that go do that in the morning, um, and then we'll do a wine tour in the afternoon. So you could almost fit it in all in one day. Um, but it is a beautiful spot um, right on the coast. And if you're if you're in Paso, there's no reason why you shouldn't at least you know. Spend a little bit of time on the coast, um, at least for one day or afternoon or morning or that sort of thing. Oh, yeah. And, you know, Hearst Castle is really such a must see. Just being up on that hill overlooking the ocean in itself is worth the trip. And then you have the castle itself and all the other buildings. It's such an amazing place. It's a beautiful spot. Lots of history, artwork. I mean, it's just I've, I've been I don't even I can't even tell you how many times lots and uh it's uh, every time i i learn new things and i just and you and you just feel like the you feel from back in the day like everything that was going on there and the parties and all the stories and it, it's pretty it's pretty spectacular absolutely and you know but before we let you go can you share an insider secret about paso robles something that you know only a long time local would know 
Yeah, so um, one of the, the newest places that's kind of a little hidden gem is called Tin City. Um, Tin City is this industrial park. It's kind of located right off the freeway um, and really you wouldn't know much about it unless an insider told you. Barrel House Brew was kind of the first to start there. Um, they've got bands and food trucks, typically Fridays and Saturdays. Um, but there's also a little Garagiste um tasting rooms and winemakers, you know, typically 2,500 cases or less. Uh, there's a cidery, there's um, a, a wine shine, which is a, a, a distillery. I mean, there's just basically, if you have a group of friends and you go down there, everyone's going to be happy because there's a little bit of something for everybody. Um, also a restaurant just opened there. So it's, it's kind of a day, you know, day thing. You could just spend the day there and, and enjoy and walk around and, and, and taste a bunch of fun stuff. It sounds like a one-stop good time. It is. <laughs> totally. <laughs> well, this has all been really excellent stuff, Katie. I definitely feel like I know a lot more about Paso Robles right now. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. I, I really had a great time. Katie Hayward is the owner of Uncorked Wine Tours, and she knows the Paso Robles region as well as anyone. For links to her site, as well as all the places we mentioned today, visit our website, visitcalifornia.com slash podcast. This is California Now. As promised, we're now going to return to our conversation with Anna McPeck from West Coast Wine Country. Katie Hayward gave us a deep look at Paso Robles. Anna will talk about some of the other great wine destinations in the Golden State. Um, I know that Napa Valley, of course, is probably the best known appellation in California. What should we expect on a, a Napa winery excursion? Yeah, so Napa is definitely the most established and, and well-known wine region in California. I think maybe in all of the USA, if you think about going to wine country, Napa is probably the region that comes to mind. Uh, that said, it's definitely the most established. You're going to find a lot of Michelin-starred restaurants all around, um, a number of three Michelin-starred restaurants, actually, a lot of very well-heeled travelers, a lot of Forbes five-star resorts, um, sports cars, and and tour buses. And of course, just a wealth of amazing winery experiences. And and what are the, the, the types of wines that Napa is particularly known for? Cabernet Sauvignon is definitely king. Uh, that is mm -hmm. what Napa is known for with without a mm -hmm. doubt. Um, all of the Bordeaux varietals, though, are, are grown there. You'll find a lot of Sauve Blanc as well. Um, and, and there's some really great Chardonnay being made in Napa, too. And can you tell us about a couple, maybe three wineries that we should seriously consider if we're planning a trip to Napa? Definitely. Um, I, I always... So, full disclosure, I love bubbly. That's my favorite. Um, <laughs> What's so, not to like? <laughs> what... One of my favorites over in Napa, um, and it's really good for somebody who is maybe uh, just beginning their their wine tasting career. Uh, Schramsberg is fantastic. Their caves are just so cool. I really recommend the tour there. They're one of the first wineries that were built in the Napa Valley, and their caves hmm. are, are old. Um, you, you go through the tour and you feel like you're in Pirates of the Caribbean. There's all this moss oh, wow. and like cool stuff growing from the ceilings. Uh, and, and their bubbles are fantastic. So I think that's a really great way to start the day. Yeah, um, sounds great. Yeah. Another one that I'm really excited about is called Theorem Vineyards. Uh, and that's a relatively new winery. It's opened within the last year or so. Uh, it's on Diamond Mountain, which is on the kind of north end of the Napa Valley um, in the Calistoga area. Thomas Rivers Brown is their consulting winemaker. He's he's quite well, well known. Um, Howard Backen did the architecture. Um, it's just a stunning, stunning facility, and they're making um, very small production Cabernet uh, uh, blends, and it's really, really beautiful and a great tasting experience. That's one of the other kind of aspects of a lot of these wine tastings and visit. You know, when you go to visit these uh, these vineyards, is that sometimes the architecture is actually quite stunning as well. There's some really beautiful kind of like uh, modern architecture. Sometimes they kind of harken back to, you know, uh, olden times. So that's mm -hmm. just another kind of kind of fun aspect to this whole kind of wine tasting and vineyard tour uh, experience. 
Yeah, without a doubt. That's that's a really good point, Soterius, actually. Um, there's a lot of different reasons that people come here and, and uh, a lot of unexpected ones. I had a gentleman one time that I planned a trip for who um, he built trains or he built like some part on trains. And he was so excited to come and just do the Napa wine train because he had this this personal passion and this professional passion for trains. And I thought that was yeah. that was so interesting, the way that you could weave that into a wine country trip. Right. That's, that's, that's funny. All right. How about one more uh, winery we need to consider in Napa? Yeah, definitely. So I was going to mention um, the new restoration hardware in Yauntville is kind of doing it all. Um, they have a showroom. They have a restaurant and they have a really cool tasting lounge. Um, it's Wait a minute. Are we talking old... about the company that sells like furniture and hardware, like upscale yeah, hardware? Yeah, that restoration And they are hardware, doing wine the... tastings. Yes, um, they have a beautiful facility right in downtown Napa that's opened re- or excuse me, downtown Yauntville that's opened recently. Um, so they have a tasting lounge at the old masonry building. It's this gorgeous historic old building and they have just great spaces kind of speckled around inside and outside. And they're actually pouring a bunch of um, wines from high-end producers, lesser-known producers, ones outside of the state of California. So you can go in and taste a range of wines there in just one of the most beautiful settings you're going to find. Wow, that sounds great. And you really and you get a selection kind of like you get to experience wines from all over the region. Yeah, it's kind of a like almost a, a co-op uh, kind of situation where they're pouring for a lot of smaller labels or like super high end labels that wouldn't necessarily have a tasting room that you could go in and find. So you actually get access to a lot of really interesting wines there. That sounds really cool. All right. What about Sonoma mm-hmm. County? I mean, I, I feel it has like a lower key atmosphere, right? So what what should we expect there? Definitely. Um, I, I always like to use the analogy, you know, if if Napa is high heels, Sonoma is where you wear wedges. Um, so <laughs> it's <laughs> it's kind of the uh, more laid back uh, sister county to, to Napa. Um, I often recommend to, to people when they're coming to the area, spend a couple of nights in Napa and spend a couple of nights in Sonoma. It's it's a really good pairing. Actually, you can you can mm. get something really fun and different out of out of each region. Um, but you can expect, um, you know, a good range of you're going to have those higher end wineries and also some of those down the dusty dirt road, little unassuming places in Sonoma um, and lots of outdoor activities, too. So if you're kind of um, an active adventurous wine drinker, uh, Sonoma might be a great place for you to come and visit. There's kayaking, there's hiking, there's zip lining, there's lots of great cycling. So so beyond wine, there's some cool stuff going on in Sonoma too. Oh, that sounds great. So and what kind of grapes should we, we be looking for when we're in Sonoma? Yeah, so Pinot Noir and Chardonnay are probably going to be the most dominant varietals that you'll find here. Um, the The climate in Sonoma is cooler than Napa. There's a nice coastal influence. So Pinot Noir is is kind of famously finicky um, and it can do really well in certain microclimates here. Um, But that said, there's lots of interesting stuff being grown up in Dry Creek Valley. There's a lot of Zinfandel over in Alexander Valley, which is a little hotter. They're producing Bordeaux and and Rhone varietals there too. Um, And across the board, there's lots of fun kind of funky lesser known stuff being grown. Can you tell us about a few specific Sonoma County wineries we should visit? Definitely. Um, so one of my tried and true favorites is Iron Horse Vineyards. Again, me and the bubbles. Uh, but it <laughs> is a really cool, cool offering. They have an outdoor tasting room. Um, so they have 360 degree views of just gorgeous vineyards all around. Um, they're the friendliest people you'll ever meet there. I Every time I go, I end up staying there for like two hours because just I get chatting with the tasting room staff. I get chatting with all the guests who are there and you just you can't break away. It's so much fun. Um, hmm. And another fun kind of tip, they do um, oysters there on Sundays through uh, certain certain periods of the year. So you can pair your, your bubbles with oysters. So Iron nice, Horse, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Iron Horse is definitely a favorite. Um, Comstock Wines up in the Dry Creek Valley, they're doing some really cool stuff with um, wine and food pairings. They have an outdoor uh, wood-fired oven, and they have a full-time executive chef. So they do a wine and wood-fired pairing, which is four courses of kind of fun seasonal cuisine paired with their um, single vineyard Sonoma County wines. And then they're launching a uh, a grilled cheese pairing, too, which is super cool. Um, they're doing it, it's not your traditional cheese play by any means. So <laughs> they're doing kind of different riffs on um, 
traditional sandwiches. So there's like a new take on a tuna melt and a croque monsieur and a Philly cheesesteak. Um, so just kind of fun and, and interesting. And the food component is just, you know, so important. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. You want to pair it with like what you're tasting and what you're enjoying, right? Yeah. And it can definitely change the way the wine shows itself. It can change the way the food tastes, the way that they work together. So so that kind of educational element is is really fun, too, when you're out tasting. And you do get hungry, too, right? I mean, it's a reality. You you're do. You have to eat somewhere. <laughs> so that's that's one of my like biggest pro tips, if there is one, is um, eat and stay hydrated while you're out wine tasting. Right. It's so important. Right, exactly. And, you know, you, you forget, but you, you know, a good hearty breakfast before you head out is so key and snacks along the way and keep drinking water. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right, right. Yeah. Do you want to name yeah. drop one more, say, in Sonoma? I totally do. Um, one of my, my own personal favorites, too, and they do a great job with the guests they welcome in. It's called Rhyme Cellars, R-Y-M-E. Super small production. They have a little tasting room in um, downtown Forestville, which is in the Russian River Valley. Uh, it's a husband and wife winemaking team, Ryan and Megan Glab, and they do super interesting kind of lesser known varietals. Um, and they're making wines that are just an, an incredible value for the price to, to kind of quality ratio there. Um, they're my favorite that they do is a, a Vermentino, which is an Italian white. Um, they actually had a kind of fundamental difference in um, ideal ideology about how they should make the wine. So they split the fruit and they broke it into a his and a hers version. Uh, <laughs> oh, really? I, pers- I personally like the hers. <laughs> but uh, okay. um, again, it's all it's all subjective, but it's right. delicious. And um, there if you want to kind of experience some some different varietals beyond those well-known Pinots and Chardonnays, this is a really, really great place to do that. That's, that sounds amazing. I mean, this is all really great information, Anna. So I, I want to move on to hit a couple of more regions while we're at it. So yeah. how about we head north uh, to the Anderson Valley in Mendocino County, which is getting a lot of press these days. Is is that yeah. buzz deserved? A hundred percent. It's it's one of my favorites. Again, um, that's my little my little getaway when I need to get away from life. Um, it's uh, northwest of San Francisco, about two hours. So it's maybe an hour north of, of Sonoma County. Um, it's a significantly cooler climate than Napa or Sonoma even. So you're going to see, again, a lot of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay up there, but also some uh, kind of aromatic white varietals like Riesling or Gewürztraminer or Chenin Blanc. Uh, and this region is definitely still being discovered. It is not fully developed yet by by any means. Um, so a lot of those tasting rooms where you can wander in without an appointment and the tasting fees aren't too hefty and they're making really, really great wines up there. And is the actual like geography different as well? I mean, the climate's a little different. Is it are they growing in like totally different conditions? Not necessarily. I mean, you know, it's it's still a, a beautiful valley with uh, hills on, on both sides, but they're definitely getting a lot of that coastal influence. The fog comes in at night and really, really cools things down. Um, it's it's stunningly beautiful. And I always suggest to people, you know, pair this trip with the coast. Um, I usually stay in, in the town of Mendocino, actually, when I go tasting up in Anderson Valley. It's great. You get your little coastal seaside getaway and then you get to wine taste on your way up and your, your way down. OK, and let's finish up a little further south. Uh, the Central Coast is serious wine country too. Monterey, Paso Robles, uh, Santa Barbara. What should we know about that part of California? Yeah, definitely. Um, Monterey, Carmel, Carmel Valley, super, super cool um, region where lots of fun wines are being made. There, um, there's a gentleman named Ian Brand who uh, SF Chronicle named the winemaker of the year last year, and he is based in the Monterey, Santa Cruz Mountains area. Um, making really, really cool stuff. They have a tasting room now in Carmel Valley. Uh, La Marea is one of his other labels, and he makes just really, really delicious, kind of clean, interesting wines um, that that you wouldn't necessarily think to see around there. Um, Caraccioli in Carmel is probably the best domestic sparkling that I've had. They're absolutely delicious, and we know that I like bubbles now. Um, <laughs> they have a, a tasting room in Carmel. 
Um, and there's lots of different places that you could, you know, seat yourself um, for, you know, the, the base of your adventures. But Carmel is a really charming little town. It's it's right on the water and feels very much like an artist's retreat. Lots of great little inns and shopping and, and dining there. Um, another cool winemaker in that kind of northern part of the, the central coast is uh, Thomas Fogarty. Um, they're making really restrained and, and beautiful wines, a lot of Pinot Noir and, and Chardonnay. Um, and then, you know, an old school, really established name, Ridge. Um, their Montebello property is up in the Santa Cruz Mountains. They're making really, you know, iconic Zinfandels. They have been for years. You know, it's so impressive that, you know, s- such great wines are being produced, not just in Napa and Sonoma, but in these other areas as well. And like, I like your idea of mm-hmm. like pairing a Napa Sonoma visit with one of these other areas because you can really kind of see almost how Napa and Sonoma started. Yeah, without a doubt. And, you know, a lot of people, especially if you're you're traveling from another country, um, that California fly-in drive trip is super iconic, right? You, you fly in and you start in either Los Angeles or San Francisco and you work your way up or down the coast. Nothing stopping you from making it a, a wine road trip throughout California. And there are so many regions that you can visit. Absolutely. So, you know, I've had the distinct pleasure of asking you a bunch of questions I have about visiting California wine country, but our listeners can do the same simply by picking up the phone or going to your website, right? Absolutely. Uh, Our website is wcwinecountry.com. That's for West Coast Wine Country. And we're super happy to help plan trips. That's what we do. So from selecting your perfect lodging, getting the right region, pairing together multiple regions, making your winery appointments, uh, getting you a driver, which we highly recommend. um, We're sort of one-stop shop for all of those things. Well, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you. It's been great. Anna McPeck and her partner, Megan Smith, are the co-founders of West Coast Wine Country, a tour operator that can help you map out the perfect Golden State adventure. You can find links to their site and to all the wineries Anna mentioned today at our website, visitcalifornia.com slash podcast. This is California Now. Thank you for listening to California Now. This podcast is produced by Visit California. I'm your host, Satirius Johnson. You can find us on iTunes and Stitcher. Please subscribe, and you can learn more about California and plan your next visit at visitcalifornia.com slash podcast. That's where you'll find our podcast and much more information. We'll provide links to all of the people and places you learn about here on the show. That's visitcalifornia.com slash podcast. We hope you enjoyed this California Wine Month episode of the podcast. We talked about Napa, Sonoma, the Anderson Valley, and several spots along the Central Coast. But we couldn't possibly cover all of the wonderful wine destinations in California in one episode. The Temecula Valley, for instance, and Santa Barbara. There are so many others. Lodi, Murphy's, Lake County. The list goes on and on. The good news is that you can find a wealth of information on these and other wine regions on our website. Go to visitcalifornia.com slash month for info, links, and more. We hope to see you out here soon. 